Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Real Talk Live. I'm Ben Ferguson. Today we have an extra special holiday show. We have a gentleman here that's local. Uh, he comes to us from back east. He uh, spent six years at Carnegie Mellon as uh, head of the drama department. And right after that, I think he did about 180 network hours of uh, Young and Restless and a few different TV shows down there. And he has come up to Santa Barbara. He is your new acting coach, the very best acting teacher in Santa Barbara and probably the whole South Coast. In fact, he's very big in Los Angeles. You known him probably as the fish approach. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Frisch. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for applause. Yeah, I, well, we'll, the, we'll have to put in our own applause put here. Put that in, okay. That's right. Hi. Hi, and thank you for coming on this show. Thank you, Ben. This is fun. Yeah, every time I see you, uh, I see you a lot on Facebook, and a lot of uh, your ads come up for your shows, and you've invited me to your classes, and which I haven't had time, but I've actually been a couple of private lessons at your house before. Right, that's right. I had forgotten about that. A long, we, yeah, it wasn't <laughs> nothing to remember. I think a long time ago, I was just getting into acting, and I had a monologue, and I freaked out and I had to do it in like three hours and I, I went online and I found you and you said okay come over to my house and I remember I, I showed you the script and you said first of all the first thing you need to do is get rid of the script I'm like I got three hours and I have to say word for word because the script wasn't very good but anyway you allowed me to just do it in your living room and it, and, and it worked out yeah well it's in LA you you uh, you have to do it uh, off book as yeah. we say um, whereas in New York, generally you carry the book during an audition, but, uh, in Los Angeles, they expect you to be off book for every, every audition and, you know, to get that full feeling. You better feeling. know your stuff. <clears throat> you you got to know your stuff and, and you got to work on it. You are big in this industry. You have done a lot of, of TV network and that's everybody's dream is to get on TV as on my channel 17 shows that I've written. That, uh, you know, I think I came to your house one time. We were doing a Pine Valley medical show. Right. Remember I bought Amber Shannon? And yes, that's right. That's right. We, we did that's a right. show in your, yeah, in your kitchen, I think. And that was fun. Yeah. I remember you were yelling at her, not so much at me. And I'm thinking, I left thinking I did well. I was hoping so anyway. Uh, I don't know. Uh, sometimes if I give. <laughs> Maybe it was so bad. That sometimes just... if I give uh, notes to people, it's because I'm really interested in what they're doing. Yeah. So well, good. You well, hopefully, we, hopefully you liked both of us. Yeah. But anyway, fun. I remember way back, I think it was 2015, where I had a show called The Evening Show with Ben Ferguson, and a lady helped me named Mo McFadden. Yes, of course. And, and, and Mo, I, Mo was, it, her job was to get me guests, because I really didn't know too many people. Uh, I just got into the theater, and I, I just started learning how to uh, get into plays, and I took an acting class. And she said, I might be able to get Peter Frisch. And I'm like, you can get Peter Frisch? And she goes, I might. I'm not saying I can. And I'm like, who's Peter Frisch? And she just what, she blew up on me. What do you mean, who's Peter Frisch? <laughs> and as soon as I Googled your name, of course, everything came up. The Young right. and the Restless, uh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, and you did. You came on to our show, and I think you were with Ivy Vahanian. Yes, who is currently, by the way, in Costa Rica. In Costa Rica? Yes, she moved with her family down there for nine months. Wow. Yeah. I, you know, I had, saw a couple of productions at the Center Stage Theater with you. and uh, That's right. Uh, Ivy was one of the... Uh, Three, there were three of us who sort of founded the theater company, producing unit, and uh, it came out of our classes because uh, one of the actors, uh, you may know Bill Egan. Bill Egan was on our show. Right, and Bill, who's, and he's been acting and directing for 20 some odd years, and uh, Bill set, turned to me one day in class and he said, you know, the work that some of the people are doing here are, is just wonderful, and nobody knows it in town because it's in a class situation. Shouldn't we have a company? So we decided to found the company. Ivy, who had been a student of mine at Carnegie Mellon and uh, just happened to wind up in uh, Santa Barbara, uh, I mean, she was a Broadway actress right before she came to Santa Barbara. She had done Wasn't 10 she, union shows in a row in New she, York. She did some New York crime shows or something. She was on a network TV show. Uh, no, she was doing live stage the whole time. No, she was. I remember when she came out of my show, I looked up and she had done a, just a very short clip of some kind of. I, yeah, I don't know about that. I okay. mean, you were a working actress, so you're doing a lot of things. Right. But uh, but she had done Broadway, et cetera. So we started the company and uh, decided to. Uh, to sort of do the residencies at uh, Center Stage. And uh, we've done eight productions. The show I went to see, she was dressed as a, a Viking. Oh, yes. Well, she looked like a Viking. And she well, smoked a cigarette in the show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was, uh, they were on a break from the Metropolitan Opera chorus. Uh, not chorus, but uh, they were extras in the Metropolitan Opera. 
So uh, they they came on with Viking uh, helmets and had a right. smoke out, <clears throat> yeah, outside incredible. the stage door. Uh, elaborate cr- costumes on that. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, we went down to uh, L.A. for those. Yeah, that didn't look like anything local, not from the costume no, shop. No, 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 no. This We don't have... <laughs> now, once I met you, I started, uh, after the talk show, I did a thing called Pine Valley Medical, which was a, a, right. a, a, a soap opera I cooked up, and I used the actual Remember community well. theater. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I would call you from time to time and say, hey, Peter, I need... Uh, uh, I did a news anchor, and you gave me four. I mean, you always helped me, which was so cool. Yeah, but sure. But you gave me four or five people, and we narrowed it down, and and uh, we, I, I, three or four people came from from your classroom to be on my show, right. and they were well, always. I like helping you, but remember, it's also uh, work for those people. It's practice. It's well, let me tell you about the you people know. you sit me. They yeah. were always there fifteen minutes beforehand, and they all knew their lines. I mean, that just shows what you've instilled in them as far as professionalism. Well, we try. Definitely to do that. I mean, I have a whole list of things I call, you know, a memo of understanding. Right. That I give to people at the beginning of class. And it's two full pages of here's what I expect when you're in class. So you are you doing, you're doing, I don't say private lessons. You're doing private lessons. I do privates. I did a coaching last night. Uh, believe it or not, I started at about 9.15, uh, the coaching, uh, for a big audition that somebody was doing. And I said, yeah, come on over and I'll help you with it. So and you help the actor polish their character polish before it they and actually then, go on. And then last night we also recorded it, which I sometimes do as well. So, you, okay. Yeah, you do a lot of camera work as far as um, um, helping the actor on, on where the cameras are going to be. I oh, remember something uh, like that. Uh, well, I do a lot of coaching on both auditioning and on um, using the camera. Right. There's a lot of actors right now just out of City College and the UCSB, a lot of them, and they want to get to work. And if they want, I mean, your, your class is perfect for them. So how would they go about getting into your class or getting a hold of you? Would they just go to online and look at the That's the best way to do it uh, because that's where they'll get the most information succinctly. Uh, and it's uh, www, needless to say. The Frisch Approach. The Frisch Approach. One, one long word. And you're about dot the, com. the most serious acting coach there is in town, from what I've seen. And I know a lot of people from the past 10 years of doing this. And you're, you're the real deal, which is kind of neat. Well, you for know. For you to actually be here. Is, I mean, I've, I've taught in four or five of the major conservatory programs. Obviously, Carnegie, uh, uh, Juilliard, Harvard, uh, Boston University's professional program. Uh, so uh, I did some work at Cal Arts too, directing and teaching. So yeah, um, that's what we do. We prepare people for the profession, and I work with people in LA in the profession, uh, and because they want to stretch, they want to grow. Right. Uh, the really strong actors know that uh, you don't stop being challenged. Right. You know, it's like uh, I play tennis, and uh, you know, top professionals can suddenly develop a little weird hook in their backhand. Well, and, when you're playing tennis, you always want to play somebody better than you. So where, where, how, as far as teaching, do you go to like professional actors? That must be nice to, to work with professional seasoned actors. Oh, yeah. And what's, what I like about it the most, <laughs> frankly, and it's a little bit of an ego thing, is they really appreciate what they're finally getting. Yeah. Because most teaching in this field and most teaching in the arts is pretty vague. Well, it's standard. What, when they go through you, they, they, they achieve things that they didn't know they were able to do. Now, I'm going to read something really quick. Now, this one, this was a testimonial, and Uh-oh. this is just, Uh-oh. yeah, no, you find it, this? it's not good, Peter. No, it, no, this is disaster. Uh, Peter is responsible for creating the kind of actor I am today. He taught me how truly, uh, how to truly take risks in my world, invest authentically in my characters, and expect nothing but professionalism. The method that Peter taught me is still the one that I use today. He gave me the tools, access emotionally and intellectually to very dense material. He allowed me to see that there is always a way that is truer and deeper than I first imagined. Now, I'm sure you know who that came from. Uh, I do. Yep. Yeah, so Julianne Moore, now this is her accepting a... a the Oscar in 2015. Oscar in 2015. And you've been with her for how long? Well, I mean, you know, I, I was her uh, teacher in her junior and senior year in Boston University, which is where she got the most intense work for me. And then uh, we've known each other off and on for She still calls you forever. From, from what I hear. Yeah, I still, I still talk to her. I saw her in New York a couple of years ago, uh, you know, at her place. And we had lunch uh, another year, a year later. And... Um, talked to her recently uh, because, uh, you know, I have a book coming out uh, probably in February. What's it called? Uh, it's called The Trans- 
the Transformational Actor. The Transformational Actor. And the subtitle is uh, Innovative Approaches for the 21st Century uh, Rehearsal and Performance. So when you have the book, obviously, you'll come back. Maybe uh, we'll have a talk show by then. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, good. Um, and uh, But she's she consented to uh, write a, a quote for, on the book for the cover after reading nice. part of it. So, yeah, she appreciates you. Now, I also yeah. read that you've done 160 different productions in New York. Has New York ever called you and say, hey, Peter, can you come out for eight weeks? And, and well, I, if I they mean, did, would you? You have to understand that a lot. Well, it depends what it is. Depends on what you're doing here, too. The, and it depends what I'm doing here. If, it, if it's long enough and if it's in advance and, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to. Is it big money if they want to get somebody like you out there for six to eight weeks? It depends what it is. If it's TV film, it's pretty good money. Right. If it's stage, no. No, but uh, a lot of times I'm I'm asked to teach and teach workshops. I have a sort of workshops to go thing, so I've done a lot of uh, workshops in San Diego, up in Tahoe, uh, that sort of thing. So you're on tour. Sometimes. I'm kind of on tour with my workshops from time to time. I don't know if this is going to work, but do you recognize these people? Uh, you're going to force me to put my glasses on. That's all right. Hold on, hold on. Uh, I don't know. Let me let me say a name. J.T. Hellstrom. No, I tried to Are find they in my time. I don't. Uh, well, think... I tried to find a couple of episodes that you actually was the producer on, and I went to your. Oh yeah, that's uh, Malcolm. Yeah, absolutely. So you remember working with Shamar these had just left the show about two weeks before I got there. Uh, Christoph. Oh, that's such so sad. He died. Off. Oh, I didn't Same know that. Time. Yeah, he did. Uh, yeah, we did a whole thing, a whole. Uh, but he, what a great guy he was. Yeah. He's a terrific guy. That's fun working with television. I think it was enormous fun. Well, I was had so much fun doing it, and you know, I th in in terms, I was producer on it. But the thing that most people don't understand is on these shows where you have to put forty five minutes in the can every day, um, you have multiple directors. And on a lot of episodics, you have uh, multiple directors as well. So we had uh, th about three and a half directors on contract, meaning that one was both a fill-in and a, did occasional shows. And um, they don't know what's going on. All they have is the script for that. As far as the storyline? Yes. They have the script for that day. They don't, I mean, they, they have the history in a fabulous way, <laughs> but they don't know what's going on. So it gives the producers more power. I was going to say, they're doing that for a reason. What? Are they doing it that way for a reason? And no, they're doing it because uh, it's so much work to prepare an episode. You can't prepare one every day. No, I mean, the people who are actually, they don't know the whole storyline. Right. They're not supposed to, right? Are they just supposed to focus in on what the story is for that day? Yeah, I mean, they know all, obviously, the backstory. They know the history of the characters, and they're just getting the latest updated day uh, for their work. So the actors have to be extremely professional. I, I, I saw a clip from Malcolm, and he was saying that if he was doing a movie or something, they would take maybe three days on doing this 10-minute scene. Where here, they just you know do a 30 uh, minutes The average in one feature day. is about two minutes a day. Yeah, you two minutes in the two minutes in the can. On the soap, we put 45 minutes in the can yeah. a day. So, you so we're that. working, what is that, 20 times faster have than you, a feature. Have you ever had an actor that just didn't quite know their lines? Or I'm always amazed, and I was always amazed. These people would get the script 6 o'clock the night before, and they would spend the evening learning 20, 30 pages. It's amazing. And what was so fascinating about it is that at the end of the day, I, I, I experimented once after about two months on the show, and I went up to a couple of the actors and I said, okay, I'm going to give you cues. What's your next line? They had no idea. They didn't even remember the scene. Uh, they learned the lines. They've trained their brains to learn the lines for that moment, and then they completely forget everything that, you know, it's quickly in, quickly out. Yeah, because that's the that's the routine of the show. Yeah. But I've always been impressed. And no, everybody knows their song. There were a few older character actors, because you know it's harder to keep the memory going when you're older. Any cue cards? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They had a couple, and some were very good at. <laughs> I don't think so. And they would turn away, and they would look at the card and come back, and yeah. you would have no idea. It looked like they were just angry or something. Yeah. But <laughs> there was one who I will not mention. Uh, now deceased, unfortunately. Well, then mention him. 
Was no. it a bad thing? No, it was, a, it was an older woman. She was the head of the I can picture her. She always had a drink in her hand. Uh, she was uh, you know, kind of an earth mother uh, type. All right. Anyway, um, and uh, she was very funny because she made no bones about looking at the cue cards. Oh, that right? It was like, you don't like it, fire me, you know? And she would look <laughs> at the card and she would talk to the card and say this to the card and then she would look at the character. <laughs> was it obvious? Yes. Yeah. It so when I obvious. first started, I, I, oh, Asa Olson was a, an acting teacher. Right. And, I, I remember that name. Yeah, she's a, a director, in, real big in Carpinteria, does a lot of... The, oh, Ace, that Ace. She was an acting teacher? She. I looked at an ad and I said, uh, it was an acting teacher back in 2015, and I went down there and I took her class and she just, I mean, she put me in a play. I was Wild Bill Hickok in Calamity Jane, and it was so much fun, except it, in the middle of the play, I walked out to the front of the stage, nobody else was on stage, and I had a monologue to do, and right when I got about, I mean, I was scared to death. And I got to the middle of it, and I went blank. And, and I swear to you, if I would have been closer to the back, I would have just left and said, sorry, it didn't work out. <laughs> but I couldn't. And I'm standing there, and I'm looking at the people, and I'm just like, I didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden, everything came back, and I continued, and I finished. Right, right, right. So anyway, I got through the show. This is, I think, my very first show. And I walked out afterwards, and one of the gentlemen said, hey, really great uh, performance. One thing I might want to mention, kind of a large gap. <laughs> part of, no, part, kind of a large pause. And I'm like, sir, that wasn't a pause. I was looking at ways to run. I didn't know my lines, but it came back to me. But that was the only time that really freaked me out. I uh, had a very similar experience, which is an amazing story, when I was 15. Uh, but I don't think I'll have time to tell the whole story. But it was... Give us a piece of it. Um, well, the piece was that I... I uh, I was at, uh, at a Strong Equity Theater, which is the Berkshire Theater Festival, and I was an apprentice, and I was 15, but, you know, I could act already. Yeah, uh, but I could act, and uh, I got had this monologue in the second act. It was like my big thing, and it was uh, su supposed to be funny, but I never quite understood it. I didn't understand what the joke was, so I had memorized it by rote. And on opening night, I came out there. There were uh, two people, including Arthur Miller's sister, was Joan Copeland, a wonderful, wonderful performer in person, was the, the head of the, the – she, she was there. And another Broadway guy was the, the, the actor, and I was supposed to be his valet. So I come out and uh, say, uh, sir, the whatever is ready. And he says, oh, uh, Joseph, I hear you're getting married. And I have this monologue about the marriage, which basically ends with, with um, me saying uh, that I don't really like her. It's a very qu queer, odd, mm -hmm. you know, piece. Uh, but I didn't understand the progression or the joke. So on opening night, because I didn't really fully understand it, I, I, I opened my mouth and I realized I had no idea where I was, what time it was. What I was doing in exactly the Exactly the feeling I had. Exactly. <clears throat> totally blank. And uh, I think I'm going to tell a story because it's, I'll try and tell it quickly. Uh, I was hysterical. Yeah. I mean, uh, I would just, I didn't come back for the curtain call. I wept profusely and ran <laughs> up and down the Berkshire Hills for the entire time. And finally, at two in the morning, literally two in the morning, uh, I'm like five miles from the residence. And I think, okay. All right, if I'm going down in the morning, if they'll let me do this, and they'll probably fire me, uh, because obviously they can't afford that again, I will come back and figure this out. The next morning at 9.30, I went down to the Playhouse. The director was there, and I apologized profusely, and I said, I am so sorry, but we, if, if, if you're willing to— So you to jammed in the middle of the performance— Oh, I was... You were gone. You were I, like I was about to I was do. gone. Okay. I What I did was uh, I, I completely was gone. And he said, so, Joseph, uh, tell me about her. And he kept cueing me. And I just nodded and I backed away. I backed off to go backstage. I just nodded and smiled. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Wow. It was really fun. So, um, so I went to the director and I said, if you will work with me, I don't understand the text. I think that's why I went up, why I forgot the lines and uh, all of that. He said, all right, I'll give you one shot tonight. So uh, I thanked him profusely. You know, he had no, 
Yeah, no you know, kidding. No, he didn't have to do that at all. I thought he would say no. And I started to work on it. That night, I got through it. I got a little titter at the end. And I got a little more confident. And night after night, I got confidence. One week stock. And then by Friday, I owned the audience. I knew every in and out. I learned about comedy timing. In one week, I, it was the biggest lesson I've ever had in this field. And fr that was Friday night. And um, Saturday night, uh, Joan Copeland uh, came to the theater and said, oh, my brother is here, Arthur Miller. He's going to be watching the show tonight. And we all went, oh, wow, how exciting. You know, Arthur Miller, the great American playwright and all of that. Um, so uh, we did the performance. I just nailed it. I had so much fun doing it. And you really can control an audience. And I knew, I learned that in that five day period. And, uh, you know, got a huge laugh on the uh, last yeah, line. Yeah, there's nothing better than an audience laughing. So, at yeah. So um, afterwards, I hear a knock on the dressing room door uh, after the curtain call. It's not Arthur Miller. Jo no, but Joan Copeland comes in. And she said, Peter, I just wanted to tell you that my brother said you were his favorite thing in the show. And that's something. So that was one heck of a week wow. from complete panic on a Monday to triumph with one of the greats Talk of the American the theater family. saying it was I was the favorite thing in a show, which was all professionals. Yeah. Now yeah. that is a story. How much time do we have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, good. I wanted to mention um <clears throat> so we're gonna we're gonna play a game here. I Oh the one of the prizes is a hoodie that says, "Dude, you're making a scene." Now it was a pilot kind you're of. You're doing a, some kind of game show. Thing? Yeah, what is so that? a game show that, and I did a couple episodes, real rough, and I'd love to get into it again. But let me just tell you, <clears throat> find out what your thoughts are. Okay. So I had two contestants, right? They came on. I had four actors. My problem was they're actors, not improv people, but four, let's four actors. Um, and here's the the gist of it is: we bring the contestants in, we show them three secret props. Right. We, we, we introduce them to the actors and we show them three props and we say you must implement these three props into your story. Now go off in 15 minutes. Write me a five minute scene. Right. So then as soon as they're done, we give them a five minute table read with the actors. Right. This yeah. is who we are. Five minutes. That's it. And we go straight to the set and we film. There's no rehearsing. There's nothing. And at the end of the 30 minutes, they have both debuted their directorial debut. Right. And they and they at the end, we saw both their their five minute shows. It was really cool yeah. because they were totally different. Right. And anyway, what do you think about that? I, I it's kind of like whose I, line is it anyway, but it's more than that. I love that as an exercise. I have often thought there should be a uh, show on television where you gave these kinds of challenges to actors. Well, help and me get this were, one on and TV. And there were big prizes. Yes. Well, let's do this. Let's do sometime. Call me in. Let's do this show at, at one of your workshops. Well, what you, here's what you should do. You should do this as a little pilot. Uh, film a five minute sizzle reel. I don't know. People listening may not know what that is, but basically, when you're trying to sell something in Hollywood, uh, very often you do a three to five minute sizzle the reel, meat, real quick, right. which is a, a quick example, uh, but well done. Right. It's got to be well done uh, of of the kind of show you want to do, and you send that sizzle reel off to the I right people. I think that's people something people would watch. Anyway, this is the uh, hoodie. The brand new hoodie that you will be playing for. That's very cute. Yes. So I, I, I have some shows. It's called How Well Do You Know Your Restaurants in Santa Barbara. So we go all the way back uh -oh. to the uh, – to the. It, it's good. You know, if I say McDonald's, Burger King, um, House of Swords, you would say House of Swords isn't the right – isn't a real restaurant. Oh, I see. Right. Uh, actually, no. We're going to do it differently. We're going to say McDonald's, House of Swords, or Clam House. You would say McDonald's is a restaurant. I just said it. You so wrong. I should be. You're going to pick out the restaurant. I should do the positive, not the negative. <laughs> yeah. The one that is there. All right. So real quick, left hand turn. You left by heart. Left at Albuquerque's. That's a restaurant. One of them is. Oh, see, I I, I thought that was one sentence. I'm sorry. Started. I'm going to name three restaurants. <laughs> Thank you. Two one at really a time. aren't. One is one is correct. Left hand turn. You left by heart. Left at Albuquerque's. Say left at Albuquerque. Uh, left hand turn. Say, say left at Albuquerque's. Uh, left at Albuquerque. That's good. You got the first one right. The next one. I don't think so, but okay. Left at Albuquerque's. That was on State Street. I used to go there. It was. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is that was. A, oh, that's right. We're doing the positive. I'm we're sorry. We're doing the positive. Because I knew left on. Yeah. I knew that was okay. My, my game show skills are kind of all right. Nico Savage Bistro. 
Montecito Bistro, Olive Mill Bistro. The f- oh, I, the one that is. Um, Let me Montecito. Be- no, Olive Mill. All of Bill, yes. you got it right. I know it wasn't. You the know, first Randy one. Rouse came the other day, yeah. and uh, the the mayor elect. He got everything. He, he answered every question. I was giving him stuff, at, you know, on my table. I, you know, as he was walking to his car, he won everything. Well, if Randy, I mean, of all people, he I suppose he, was a paradise. Been a you know restaurateur right. here in town for okay. thirty years. A little bit of heaven, little Audrey's, little known fact. I, little Audrey's. That's correct. Yes. Spikes, Glendora's, or Nolita. Now, this one was in Galita, so. Spikes, Glendora. Just say Spikes. I would only probably say Spikes. Yeah, yeah, good one. (laughs) Geezers, teasers, or pleasers? Teasers. Nice. Chart house, blue house, cat house. Uh, that would be a very interesting restaurant if it were Cat House, but I think it's Chart House. You are correct. <laughs> we're getting to the end here. Starfish, clams, oysters. Now, this was over in Upper State Street in that parking lot. That's a well, tough Well, just one. the best name would be Starfish. It would be, but in this case, Oysters was the restaurant. Oysters that's oh, right. wait. I'm thinking I'm I... am sorry. Do, I have, I have I one question at the it. end that you might be able to take everything. I also have a chocolate orange thing. If you get, if you get the last one right, you get everything. You are too funny. Aloha, Bobby and Rose. Hawaiian Aloha. Or Aloha Burgers. Aloha Burgers? Yes. Do you remember that place? I don't. You'd go in there, it, and all of a sudden you're eating, and, and a strobe light would look like lightning, and, the, and you'd hear thunder, and it would start raining. It? It was when you get off uh, Carrillo and you turn left to go to State Street. It was on the right-hand side before you got to State Street. Okay. It was by the fire uh, firehouse. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, this is for everything. This is for this and for the chocolate orange, which is the coolest thing in the world. I don't know if you've ever had them, but they, they break up in sections. I really like this stuff. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to read you a quote. And if you can tell me who wrote this quote, you win everything. If not, not. My heart is in the work. Andrew Carnegie. Nice. Nice. Oh, I almost knocked this over. You are a winner. Oh, my God. That's, your, That's awfully nice of yeah, you. The, yeah. The, the, and Andrew Carnegie, I, I, 50-50 shot, you'd get that right. This is great. But that's from your oh, yeah. your days at uh, yeah. Carnegie Mellon. Absolutely. And that a very important thing. And uh, I also visited the, the, uh, the his birthplace, which is in Dunfermline in, in Scotland. Scotland. Nor- just north of... Uh, Edinburgh. You know, I read about he, right in the middle of his whole industrial craze. He went to Scotland when the business here was the the, the people were uprising and they were having. Remember, they were they the were first uh, Dunf- killing people. Dunfermline had the first uh, Carnegie Hall. I didn't know. A that. little. It's adorable. It's probably seats about uh, 140 people. And it's a little thing with a little balcony. It's, you know, it's I went cute. to Manhattan a couple of years ago, and and I I didn't know what I was doing. But I only had three days there, so I took a train all the way to the top just to go to the park, and there was Carnegie Hall, and I'm like, wow, yeah, that's a beautiful. And the park's right there, but man, let, I was. Let me give you an interesting observation about Andrew Carnegie. Yes. So he was born in this house, which is not in Dunfermline, but outside, probably a mile outside. And across the street are the ruins. Real quick, I don't want to interrupt, but I have to. But he, Carnegie Hall is the industrial magnet who was in charge of all the steel. Andrew Carnegie, and he's the one that made skyscrapers go up in the air. Oh yeah, yeah. And then he put he Carnegie did libraries all, in every right. city of the United States. And he brought all the. Uh, he's a good man. All the people. F- well, <laughs> he had some labor problems. There were some labor problems. <laughs> yes, Pinkerton police. He hired them. Remember that? That's right. Yeah. To oh take yeah. Care of they people. it was they had a rough uh, few days there. Yeah. He did. Uh, but uh, but uh, he he was uh, a marvelous. Uh, obviously, he was he was brilliant. So he grew up, and facing him was Macbeth's castle, Macduff. You know the whole that whole lineage from the medieval times. Uh-huh. The ruins were significant. I mean, they weren't like some of the beautiful churches or things like that. They were significant. But here he is, in a house, growing up opposite the biggest power in the entire, you know, in Scotland. And I believe that one of the reasons he had the appetite to be, you know, king of the industrial world uh, was that he grew up opposite the ruins of the most powerful people in Scotland. 
and there was nobody else around. There's something to be told. I, I was talking to Randy Rouse the other day about the book, The Secret, and the frequencies and what we keep in our subconscious and what, what we bring to ourselves. And I think there's some truth there. And I think that's what you're saying. I mean, if he, if he lived next to that, he saw it possible for himself to, to do the same thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what um, I'm trying to do with this talk show. I'm trying to <laughs> subconsciously and consciously bring it to me. Yes, well. It is here. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. But Carnegie, uh, he is a. Uh, I, I've since, like, we got about one more minute. Left. He's, he's one of my. I, I liked him. I know there's a lot of bad things that happen as far as labor yeah. and whatnot. But, but he went for it, and then he put. Well, he, he yeah. I mean, he, he's kind of like uh, Mike Tobes was in this town. I remember Mike. You Tobes. know, you acquire that wealth and then you really understand we've got to give back and he put and, carnegie libraries in almost almost every city in the united states and the first carnegie library was also in dumfermline wow adorable little thing and all of that and then he spread it all around the world the libraries exactly yeah and there's a the carnegie library and and it's carnegie carnegie yes sorry uh i would i would once once i went to scotland and i realized said carnegie it's yeah so yeah. Uh, right. So uh, in New York, of course, everybody calls it Carnegie Hall. Uh, and I keep correcting everybody and saying Carnegie. Yeah. Car it's actually Carnegie. 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 With a, with a shamrock. Well, yeah. So listen, we have 20 no, seconds shamrocks. left. Let's talk about shamrock somewhere else. All right. So, uh, shillelagh <laughs> is what I meant. Let's talk about your <laughs> let's talk about your class real quick. <laughs> ship, uh, uh, ship, fresh approach. The fresh approach. The, yes. And how do people get to you? They go online. The fresh. www the fresh approach uh winter uh spring session begins january 23rd january 23rd i read that and i have uh w an evening class in here and in you, Santa he Barbara. is the real absolute real deal whether you're a polished actor or you're just out of the drama department at ucsb this is the class to be in yeah i well, know for a first hand because i've worked with your people yeah i do serious work yeah i mean and let me know if yeah. i can come and we'll do the game show sometime in your class if you ever think that might be possible that's funny sometime. well might be amusing. Yeah, it'd be fun. It'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. Are we all out? We're over time. Anyway, guys, thanks very much. Thank you again, Peter Fish, for, for showing up. And we'll see you next Pleasure, time. Pleasure, Ben. Your, Take when care. Your, when your book's written. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us. Happy holidays. We'll talk to you later.